Well, hello, church. If you'd open to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy 3. Begin in verse 14. Pick up where we left off last week. We'll do two Advent sermons in this text. So we'll come back to this again next week. But let's read verse 14 through verse 16. This is God's Word. I hope to come to you But I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how you ought, how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. So Father, we praise You that Your Son has accomplished all of this. Lord, could we see Him today? Would You allow us, Lord, through the eyes of faith, to see more of Your Son, to see Him rightly, to see the One who, it says, we have seen His glory, the glory of the only One from the Father, full of grace and truth. Lord, would You allow us to see Him and marvel at Him and love Him. And Lord, that we could leave here and give You more glory with our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't know about y'all, but when, uh, when Advent begins every year, I, I feel I have this, uh, this tension in my own heart uh, that two things are happening simultaneously. Uh, at one level, I am uh, less and less impressed with the culture's version of Christianity. It seems very dull, uh, boring uh, to me. And then um, I'm increasingly excited about uh, Christ's uh, focus in Advent and having a, a more Christian, long, long drawn out, joyful meditation on Christ, His incarnation, and all that me- that means for the world. And um, and it, it really is strange Adventing in America, because uh, at one level our culture continually, year after year, seems to display more their hatred for the light of Christ. While at the same time during Christmas, you can't go in a store or a restaurant and not hear songs about Christ. And um, it's just, it's amazing in a culture so disinterested in Christ, how predominant Christmas carols still are uh, in our society. Uh, No matter how much people want to remove Christianity from the public square, no, no matter how politically incorrect it is to talk about the gospel, Uh, you can't go anywhere in this season without hearing Christmas carols in the background. They are everywhere. And, you know, I just kind of smile when I, when I hear uh, these carols, because a carol means uh, a song of good news, of good tidings, uh, and they're full of Christian truth. So carols are in our society uh, light in the darkness, light going forth into the darkness. They are lasting fruit from previous centuries of Christians who intentionally advented. Uh, How did previous generations preserve Christian truth even into our day? Songs. Uh, These songs that we just sang. The gospel is being proclaimed through song into the culture every December. Uh, Year after year, gospel songs keep proclaiming Christ into our increasingly secular culture. And not just in the culture, in the the home. I don't know about y'all's homes. uh, In our homes, we have a lot of singing uh, of these same songs, these glorious truths. We've done a tradition now. It's become a tradition for the last five or so years. Uh, We've had uh, people in our home, and Priscilla keeps increasing that list uh, of, of those who come in our home. So we did two, the last two weekends, we've had uh, nearly 100 people in our home just singing, uh, really just singing. 
And if you didn't come this year, hopefully you can come next year. Uh, you're invited. And uh, we just sing these glorious songs about Christ. And, uh, and it, it, even if you're not singing them in the home, you're hearing them. Maybe they're on a playlist and they're, you're, you're hearing them in the background uh, of what you're doing. And I just want to remind us of some of the lyrics of these songs. So listen to, and we even sang this just a few moments ago, Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set your people free. From our sins and fears release us, Christ in whom our rest shall be. Charles Wesley, 18th century. Or O come thou rod of Jesse free, thine own from Satan's tyranny. From depths of hell thy people save to rise victorious from the grave. Uh, or a 12th century Latin hymn translated about 200 years ago into English by John Mason Neal. O come, O come, Emmanuel, which goes on, and ransom, cap ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. Or listen to this newer uh, hymn. I don't know if we've sung this one together as a church, but it says this, Child of the stable, secret birth, the Lord by right of lords of earth. Let angels sing of the king newborn. The world is weaving a crown of thorn, a crown of thorn for infant head, cradle soft and manger bed, eyes that shine in the lantern's ray, a face so small, it's nest of hay, Face of a child who is born to scan the world he made through eyes of man. And from that face in the final day, earth and heaven shall flee away. Or another by Wesley. Hark the herald angels sing. We say Christ by highest heaven adored. Christ the everlasting Lord. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail incarnate deity. Born that man no more shall die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. Or Isaac Watts, joy to the world. No more let sin and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. And these are, we can, we're going back hundreds of years in church history, uh, these songs I've just mentioned. But we could go all the way back into the fourth century in Latin, it was translated in, into English in the 18th century. It says, praise him, all you hosts of heaven. Praise him, angels in the height, powers and dominions bow before him. Extol his glorious might. Let no tongue on earth be silent. Let each heart and voice unite evermore, evermore. And then my favorite, we just sang third century, some say fourth century. I think there's evidence this could be a, a third century. It's an Eastern hymn brought into the West uh, a number of years ago. Let all mortal flesh keep silent. Just sounds old because it is old and it's very sacred. And there's just this reverence for the holiness of Christ. And, and so our earliest songs that we sing at Christmas don't just go back to the third century or the fourth century. We actually should be singing and are singing uh, songs that go back 3,000 years. We call them psalms that were commanded in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 to sing corporately psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. It says, sing to one another, sing to the Lord. And so we continue to learn new psalms that we can sing. And here's one of the things that surprises, I think, a lot of people who begin to do a deeper dive study in the scriptures is one of the things that you begin to realize is there's actual liturgical practices that are explicitly taught to the church that we should be doing now, as a people. I remember the first time that I, I heard someone read a, a pre-written prayer in a, in a church service, and I'm like, what are you reading your prayer for? Can you not just pray? I mean, what, what's spiritually wrong with you that you need to read a prayer? Um, I, I remember uh, the first corporate confession or closing doxology, and I just thought, How, this has got to be just dead formalism. These people don't have the spirit. They can't just talk to the Lord right there. They got to write it beforehand. And I just didn't have categories uh, for this till I began to study the scripture and notice that there's doxologies and corporate confession and 
corporate scripture reading and creedal and confessional statements. And I noticed hymns and fragments of hymns appearing all over the New Testament. For example, uh, Romans eleven thirty three to 36 is a hymn. Many believe uh, early Christians set it to a tune to be sung. Many believe Ephesians chapter 1, that long, uh, I don't know if it's 13, 12 or 13 uh, verses, it's one sentence in English, seems like one long, long run on sentence. That was actually, many believe, a hymn. It was sung by early Christians. Ephesians 5.14, there's a little three-line fragment of a hymn, and it's indented in your Bible, you can see, because translators understand that's what it is. There appear to be portions of a song in Colossians 1.15 about Christ's deity. Philippians 2.6 about Christ's humiliation and him coming to earth. And then his exaltation are a psalm to be sung. Uh, Titus 3.4-7 to 7 has all the earmarks of a hymn or part of a hymn that could easily be sung. And others point to, and we'll get to this in coming months, in 2 Timothy, uh, that there are portions and fragments of a hymn. And you go, okay, well, how do we know when we're just reading through the scriptures that something is a hymn? How how would we figure that out? And I'll give a few criteria. One of them would be what we call contextual dislocation, kind of a technical term, um, but it simply means that some phrase, when you're reading it in its context, it doesn't seem to fit. It seems dislocated, like it's kind of inserted and it doesn't belong in the normal narrative, and you go, okay, maybe this is inserted, and it's something that he's quoting. You also see, secondly, a change in style. So you might be reading something that's prosaic, uh, and then it flips over to poetic style. Third would be some kind of introductory phrase. We'll get to something. I'll say something more about this in a second, but you've got a normal flow. You're just reading through this passage, and then there's some sort of introduction into what might be quoted or look like It doesn't belong there. Uh, Fourth, the use of parallel or antithesis. So basically juxtaposing two things in parallel forms uh, often shows there's some sort of rhythm or rhythmic pattern in which it's to be read. And then lastly, uh, rare vocabulary. Many times there's words used that aren't used anywhere else in that book or anywhere else in the Bible. It's a unique word in Greek. Uh, and, And so if you see one or two of those things, okay, maybe not a big deal. When you see all of those, you you step back and you go, this may be a hymn, uh, an early hymn. Here's why I bring all this up. Here's why this is relevant for us this morning. In our passage in verse 16, all five of those criteria are met. There's no debate among scholars. This is a hymn. This was sung by the church in previous generations. And so you'll notice, even in whatever translation you're using, you'll notice verse 16 is set apart, uh, kind of like you would set apart uh, a quote of the Old Testament or a, some sort of poetry or something. And, and then there's a rhythmic pattern. He was revealed in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up into glory. There's a type of, of rhythm Uh, with how those six uh, aorist verbs uh, are paralleled with words like flesh, nations, angels, world, glory, human, divine, heavenly, earthly, above, below. Uh, The the parallel and the rhythm show us that this was likely sung. Here's the biggest clue. Here's what we can pay attention to in verse 16. It says this, We confess... We confess, showing this is a common confession of the church. So however you take this, whether it is a early creedal statement, which is possible, and I think it is, and I'll talk about that more next week, or an early hymn based off of a creedal statement, either way, uh, the practical benefit and the effect on the church is the same. Either you're saying it together or you're singing it together. But everybody's saying these words, either in song form or just verbally saying it, but it's saying, we confess, 
This is our common confession. This is what we believe about the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not something uh, being confessed or sung by the world. This is being confessed and sung, verse 15 says, by the household of God, which is the church of the living God. And why do we say this? Because nobody else cares. Nobody else cares to say anything about Jesus that's right or glorious. And so the church raises her voice and confesses this. I want to point out this first. I'm going to give just two points here. One is this. You cannot separate those confessing Christ from those in the church. You can't disconnect those two things. Look at verse 14. I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how you ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh and it goes on. So the confession the church gives about Christ is a primary uh, purpose of the church and a way to identify who the church is. Now, it's true that there's things that you do to behave in the household of God. We've talked about those in previous weeks. There's certain qualifications for elders and deacons. There's, uh, there's gender distinctive roles in how men and women relate to each other and to the Lord in corporate gatherings. He's, he's gotten into some of these things, but there is a sense in which the essence of the church under all of that is our common confession. That the essence of the church is we come together and what do we do when we come here? We confess. And what do we do when we scatter and we leave here? We confess. You you could say this is what we're about. Confessing Christ rightly. This is not a mere formalism. This is, uh, listen to these passages. Add some weight behind this. I want us to see this is how you enter into the church. This is how you persevere with the church to glory. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, so confession and belief always got to go together if it's right confession, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Hear the connection between confession and faith, okay? Don't miss that. You will misunderstand everything I'm saying today. The connection between faith and confession. But look at 1 Corinthians 12, 3. No one can say, or we could say confess, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. So you need the Spirit of God in order to confess Christ in the way that Scripture is teaching. 1 John 2.23, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. 1 John 4.2, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from from God. And so 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15, speaking of the church of the living God, they are saying, great indeed, we confess. You you can't separate the church of the living God, the true church, from the true confession of Christ. These things are always connected. And guys, look, one of the biggest um, attacks on Christianity since, I would say, the the 60s and 70s, 1960s and 70s, has got to be postmodernism and the individualistic relativism that seeped into the minds of almost every Westerner to some degree. Um, Basically convincing even many Christians, you can make a confession privately and still go to heaven. There's a lot of people who, who believe that, actually. 
They believe you can make a confession of Christ privately and actually go to heaven. It's, it's absolutely amazing that you can just, you and Jesus, just me and Jesus, I believed in him, I confessed him, me and him, we did this together, but I'm going to heaven. Many people believe that. Even though Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32, everyone who confesses me before men, I will confess before my father who's in heaven, but whoever denies me or doesn't confess me before men, I will deny before my father who is in heaven. I take that to mean public confession of Christ is absolutely necessary for Christianity. There is no Christianity apart from public confession. Therefore, you can't say, my religion's private. Can't say that. And it also means that the church is essential to Christianity. I mean, if we, do we learn anything from 2020? COVID? I mean, we learned a lot of stuff probably we could say, but I mean, there's one thing I keep hearing. I keep hearing Christians say, I learned how essential the church is. Why? Because the government health officials were saying, you can't go meet with them. Go to the ball field, go right, right in the street. You can, you can gather with others. You just can't gather with the church. Well, it's interesting, even in you know, many states with the, loose, or the, the tightest regulations, you were still allowed to gather with your family. And as, if I'm reading this right, the household of God household of God is family language. That's the church. And then I've got someone telling me I can't gather with my family. That's what, that's the the only people you're allowed to gather with, but we weren't allowed to gather as a family. And so it really pushed many people to go, how much authority does the government actually have? You know, can they tell us not to meet with our family? Can they tell us not to gather as a church and confess the name of Christ Together, the church is essential. And I know, I know even as I'm saying this, all y'all's minds, I know what y'all are thinking. You're thinking of Cyprian, right? Everybody here, that's your you know, early Christian. Um, everyone's thinking of, of Cyprian, who the great theologian of North Africa, martyred in the third century, who said this, he who will not have the church as his mother cannot have God as his father. And before you write him off as a papist, that was before all the Romish doctrines began to pervert the gospel. This is a faithful brother, a martyr for the Lord who famously said this also, outside of the church, there is no salvation. Is there any biblical weight to that? I mean, I know, I know you could go many bad directions with that, but is there anything good that you, is, in any sense, is that true? Apart from the church, there is no salvation. Well, the Belgic Confession agrees with it, written in 1561. This was actually an attempt by the reformers, the Protestants, during the Spanish Inquisition, when they were trying to kill all the Protestants, they wrote this to guard against Many of the, the lies from the Catholic Church. Article 28 says, quote, We believe that since, this, uh, that since this assembly and gathering is of those who are saved, that there is no salvation apart from it. No one ought to withdraw from it, content to be by himself, regardless of his status or condition, but we are all to gather with it. End quote. Uh, the Westminster Confession also speaks to this when it says this, the house and family of God out of which ordinarily there is no salvation from God. Ordinarily is an, is an important word because they're saying somebody could be at home sick, surely. You know, somebody may be traveling that week. There, there's reasons you might not be gathered with the church. But ordinarily, you know, there's the thief on the cross, right? He didn't really have time to join a church. So you can get, you're saved by faith, right? But anyone who's saved by faith and continues to live the Christian life, 
is going to be with the church. Any saved person will be found in the household of God. Guys, even, even secular hostile governments in countries that are trying to kill Christians understand this. You know where they don't look for the Christians? On their Facebook page. I wonder if they posted a verse. That's how we'll find them. You know, looking through their windows, seeing if they're praying, uh, having their morning devotion. That's not where they, how they try to find the Christians. What do they do? They wait for Sunday morning. And they go to the church. And they take out all of them. Because that's where they're at. I mean, if somebody wanted to take out all the Christians in Pensacola, where would they go? <laughs> It'd be really easy. You could knock out about 95% of the Christians in the city if you just went to all the churches in Pensacola on Sunday morning. And you'd miss the ones that are at the nursing homes and, you know, homesick and traveling and things. But you'd get most of them because they're in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. Ephesians 2 says, we have access in one spirit to the Father. So you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God. Galatians 6 says, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And listen, listen to the connection in Hebrews. This amazed me this week. Hebrews makes a connection between the household language, church being a household, a family, and confession. This is an amazing connection. You'd have to read chapters 3 to 10 to really see it in full, but let me just give us a, a short portion. So Hebrews 3 verse 1, Holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was also faithful to all God's house. Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory the builder of a house, has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify the things that were to be spoken later, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence in boasting and hope. You're part of the house if you hold fast your confidence and hope. Now, that little phrase at the end, hold fast confidence and hope, Chapter 4, verse 14 in Hebrews says, hold fast our confession. And in chapter 10, verse 23, it says, let us hold fast our confession. It seems to be the holding fast that gives evidence that you're part of the household of God is your confession of hope in Christ. And who made this confession first? Jesus himself before Pontius Pilate, it says, made the good confession. So that's the first point. You can't separate those confessing Christ from those in the church. Number two, the church can make this confession because it alone is the pillar and buttress of truth. The church can make this confession because it alone is the pillar and buttress of truth. So there's not uh, this worldly set of truths over here, and then these Christian set of truths over here, there's just truth. There's just truth. And the church is the pillar and buttress of truth. The, the church has what God has revealed <clears throat> to help us understand all that is true. Now, here, here's what's interesting with our context as I think this is very important for us to get, get this right. Who is, what, what city is Timothy pastoring in? He's pastoring in Ephesus. What do we know about Ephesus in the first century? There's something significant in Ephesus. Well, it has one of the seven ancient wonders of the world there. Does anybody know what that is? It's the temple of Artemis was there. The temple of Artemis. 
And we actually have some help from scripture in Acts 19. We learn about something that happened in Ephesus regarding the temple of Artemis. Uh, There was a riot that broke out and happened in Ephesus. Paul was there and it says this, the whole city began crying out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And it says, for about two hours, they cried out with one voice, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, great is Artemis. Two hours, they're yelling this out, making a what? Corporate confession of their allegiance to who? Artemis. Interesting context for Paul to talk about the church's confession. So the Ephesians pagan confession shows allegiance to a false deity. Christians confession is to Christ as Lord of all. The Ephesian confession as they gather, great is Artemis. The Christians gather and they confess great is the mystery of godliness And then it goes on about Christ. You see what Paul's doing? This is really important for us to see. There's a a word here. Homologominos. You got to break it down in parts to see what this word means. Homo, the same. Logos, to say. Uh, It means to say the same thing. That's the word confession. So ESV translates it, we confess. Some of you may have an NIV. It says, by common confession, the King James or New King James would say, without controversy. Without controversy. So we're confessing something that isn't controversial to us. We've all settled this. We all know who Jesus is. This wasn't, uh, this is why we reject, you hear this, you know, at a public university, you'll hear Christians started worshiping Jesus as God in 300 AD. You know, the Council of Nicaea, this is when they declared that, no, right here it says we confess. We're in agreement. There's no controversy. We all know who Jesus is. He he came in the flesh. He's the eternal son of God. That's settled in the church from this early time. And it's essentially proclaiming that the truth is Jesus Christ. This creed, this hymn, it, it, it goes on to give six characteristics of Christ. We're only going to get to number one today. Next week, we'll look at the last five. I want to take a few more minutes and just see this first confession. Verse six, great indeed is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh. That's the church's first thing out of their mouth to confess about Christ. God's son came in the flesh. First John 4, 2, by this you will know the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. John 1, 14, the word, the logos, the truth of all truths became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was not vague when he said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And then he said, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. The mystery of godliness is not a doctrine. It's not a moral system. It's not a a philosophical reality. The mystery means something that was hidden is now revealed. The word mysterion has this idea. Something hidden, now revealed. Godliness has now been revealed. What is godliness? It's godlikeness. Godlikeness has now been revealed. Deity has now been revealed. We're not talking about a doctrine here. We're talking about a person. We're not talking about a theological principle. We're talking about a person. They are proclaiming in Ephesus, great is Artemis. And the Christians are saying, great is the mystery of godliness. God has been revealed in a person, Jesus Christ, manifested in the flesh. Verse 16, he is revealed. He is manifest. Phaneru. It means to make visible the 
The one who was invisible has been made visible. The eternal God existing outside of time and space enters into time and space and makes God known there. This is what the church professes. Uh, These are glorious. Colossians 1. The firstborn of all creation. Listen to the tension, this mysterious tension. Christ is the firstborn of all creation. So he's human. He has a human mother. He's born at one point confined in a mother's womb. And at the same time, next verse, by him all things were created. In heaven and on earth, invisible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions and rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Same person. Verse 17, he is before all things and him all things hold together. He is the head of the church, head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Verse uh, 19, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. He was not created. He was and is creator. He's not appearing in angelic form or in uh, ghostly mystical form. He is appearing physically. The mystery of godliness is not a what. The mystery of godliness is a who. It is a person. It is who Peter made the apostolic confession about John 6. Peter said, Lord, where are we going to go? To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You are the the truth of all truth. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And Peter confesses in Matthew 16, Jesus asks, "Who who do they say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, Peter... On this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. On that apostolic confession, his church has been built to which the gates of hell will not prevail. Anyone, even in this room, even today, who comes to Christ confessing with full surrender, with repentance of sin and faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you will not only enter the church, you will not only never see the gates of hell, you will become part of the household of God, part of those confessors that confess Christ into glory and throughout eternity. It's absolutely amazing. What an invitation. What an amazing truth and an amazing Christ that we have. We'll keep meditating on him next week. Let's go to the table and continue our thought on Christ. Um, He wants to minister to us here. This isn't just a time where we think about him. This is a time where he has thought about us. He has given himself for us. And he wants to renew us in his grace. And we confess him here. Christ welcomes all of those who confess Him as Lord, who have done that through baptism, who've placed their faith in Christ. If that is you, please join us. If you'll be refraining, uh, you can find on page two of your bulletin uh, a very meaningful prayer to pray during this time. Let's pray and prepare our hearts to come to the table. Oh, Father, You so loved this world that you gave your only begotten, not created, begotten Son, that whoever would believe in him will not perish, but have eternal life. We thank you for the simplicity and the beauty and the freedom that your gospel brings, that it is powerful to save any who will believe. Lord, we we pray for anyone here who has not put their faith in Your Son, Jesus Christ, that they would do so. That they would grab a hold of Christ for life. 
And Lord, we just ask that you would help us to worship you at this table and in song and throughout this week. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.